Pastor Brian Schwertley of Reformation Fellowship, Reformed Presbyterian Church of North America. And I'm Pastor Stephen Pribble of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Welcome to Reformation Forum, the, pl the program relating the unchanging truth of Scripture to current issues. Tonight's subject is Focus on the Family. We're continuing to examine the family in light of today's problems. You know, Stephen, how does the Bible define love? You know, so many people think of love as just an emotion, and it's so important that we define love biblically. It surely is. Brian, uh, it's important to define uh, all terms relating to, uh, uh, to interpersonal relationships biblically. Uh, we spoke at the end of the last program about dysfunctional families. Now, there's a term that you don't find in the Bible, and uh, we have to begin to think in terms of biblical categories. So that's a good, good question. Uh, the way that the Bible defines love is by uh, a demonstration of love. And it says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, one of the modern translations puts it like this, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so you can see just from that verse that the Bible speaks of love not as an emotion, not as a feeling, uh, not as a romance, but the Bible speaks of love in terms of God giving. Uh, love gives. Love is self-sacrificing and self-giving. And that's how the Bible defines love. One of the most beloved verses in all of the Bible is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Again, God loved, he gave. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so keep that in mind. Uh, and young people, young ladies, if a, a man, if a young man tells you he loves you, you have to define terms. You have to find out in what way does he love me. Does that mean, is that a code word for the fact that he wants my body? He has a lust for me? Uh, we have to understand that love is giving. Well, Brian, people uh, fall in love and they get married, and, uh, and sometimes there are problems that result after a marriage, and anytime two people are living in close proximity, there's a prob there are problems. How should married couples deal with anger? I know you've done a lot of research in this particular area. Uh, it's a very, uh, Jay Adams, who's a famous biblical counselor, said that over 90% of the problems that he sees in the counselor's office, and we're talking about Christian marriages, have to do with uncontrolled anger in the marriage relationship. Now, first of all, we have to make it very clear that anger in, in and of itself is not sin. Now, there is sinful anger, and that is anger for example, that is not based upon a violation of God's law. For example, they were angry, the Pharisees were angry at Jesus Christ, and they had no just reason to be angry against him, and that's unjust anger, and that's uncalled for uh, from the beginning. But there is such a thing as just anger, and remember, God gave us anger as an emotion, okay, to help us to deal with problems. Now, we know that Jesus became angry uh, at the people in the temple buying and selling doves, and we know that Jesus never ever sinned. So there is a, a biblical form of anger. Now, the question is, is when we get angry, we have to deal with anger biblically. Now, Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Now, if you get angry, first we have to take into consideration that there usually are two responses to anger. <clears throat> there's the person who blows up, loses his temper, starts to shout and yell, and then there's the person who clams up. Now, uh, a lot of times the one who clams up is the wife, and a lot of times the one who blows up is the husband, but it's not always so. Sometimes it's the other way around. We call clamming up the silent treatment, and then we call blowing up, you know, living with somebody who blows up, who cannot control their anger, is like living at the bottom of an active volcano. So how do you deal with that situation? The Bible says, first of all, uh, to remain, control yourself, okay? Don't blow up and don't clam up. Control yourself. Now, if you have a problem with those things, what you want to do is remain silent. You know, the old books would say count to ten. What I like to do is memorize scripture from the Proverbs on anger and recite that to yourself and re remain control. That's the first step. Don't blow up and don't clam up, but gain control of yourself. The next thing you want to do is you want to attack the problem that caused the anger. You want to deal with the sin that occurred in the marriage relationship. So what you want to do is instead of arguing at each other and attacking each other and yelling at each other, 
you remain in control and you attack the problem. You focus your attention at the problem instead of each other, okay? The goal of marriage, of Christian marriage, is not to win debates. The goal of Christian marriages is to have personal sanctification and growth in the marriage relationship. So instead of directing that at each other, direct the problem, direct your anger, and your focus your energy, controlled energy, at the problem. Then the next step is reconciliation. Whatever happened, you want confession, you want an apology, a genuine apology, without excuses, without blame shifting. And then you want reconciliation in the marriage relationship. You want to confess your sins to God. And that's the biblical process of dealing with anger in a nutshell. And what you want to do is you want to practice this over and over and over in the home. And then you want to rehabituate yourself to dealing with anger biblically in the home. And that's very, very important. And this book here that we're offering, Solving Problems in the Home, I have a very, very detailed uh, analysis of how to deal with anger. Anger is a problem for most people. I used to have a very tough time controlling my temper. And using the Word of God and studying the Word of God has really helped me to get control over that problem. And please give us a call and send for this book. You know, Stephen, uh, a lot of Christians, in fact, most Christians, send their kids to public schools. Um, should Christians send their kids to public schools? Well, Brian, uh, I would like to focus my answer on the, uh, the responsibility that Christian parents have. And it's very clearly spelled out in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 4 through 9, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the <coughs> posts of thy house and on thy gates. Here, God very clearly spells out the responsibilities of godly parents to train their children to follow in their faith. Uh, the, the New Testament says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And I can testify as a Christian parent that that is my greatest joy. And that's what I want for my children. I want them to learn to love the Lord as I do and then learn to follow the Lord as I have attempted to set a godly example in the home. But it, right in the middle of this section, there is a responsibility to parents, and it's inescapable. It says, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And uh, so godly parents have the responsibility for teaching their children. Now, in some cases, uh, uh, parents may feel ill-equipped uh, to teach their children certain subjects, and so maybe it would be advisable to send the child uh, to someone who would be in the place of the parent, someone who would, who would have the, the parent's authority. But in the scriptures, uh, as, we've, as we've read this, you can see that the responsibility for training children is not just something that, that happens <coughs> a, a few hours each day. It's, it happens throughout the day. It happens as families live and grow together. Uh, teach them diligently to thy children. Talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Wherever you go uh, as a family, you have the re <coughs> responsibility for Christian education. And so uh, Christian parents need to send their children to either a Christian school or teach their children themselves. Or yeah. if in a certain rare circumstances, there's no other choice but to send them to the public school, then uh, the, the, ch the parents need to exercise great control over what, is, what, what goes into their children's minds. <coughs> and uh, today, what happens in many homes is that the, the children are given over to the public schools and they're given over to the TV, and the children are taught alien values. They're taught values that are contrary <coughs> to the Christian faith. Brian, I know that you and uh, your wife are involved in homeschooling. And uh, why is homeschooling so important? Homeschooling is very, very important because the ch it's the parent's responsibility to see to it that your children are taught Christian values and are taught the biblical worldview. You know, there is no neutrality. The public school is an anti-Christian school. It's a state school. And its job is not to teach people about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the idea that we can ignore religion and that we can have a school that's supposedly neutral where religion is ignored 
you know, when a child goes to school and he doesn't hear a prayer to Christ and he doesn't hear that we should worship Jesus Christ as God and he doesn't hear that we have to submit to Jesus Christ in all areas of life, he's being taught that Christ is unimportant. Even if they don't say one word about religion, if Christ is not worshipped as king and lord of the universe, that school is teaching that child that Jesus Christ is not important. And Jesus Christ is the most important person in the world because he's God and he's lord and he's savior. Now, the public school system has a pro-homosexual, a pro-abortion, okay, uh, anti-Christian agenda. And it's very, very discreet, but it's very, very wicked. And it's very important that you get your Christian out of the public school if you can afford it, and either put them in a public, and either put them in a Christian school, a good solid Christian school, uh, which are few and far between, or homeschool. And the thing about homeschooling is, is then you have the opportunity. He uh, he read the passage I was going to read, by the way, from Deuteronomy six. But you have the opportunity to teach your children the biblical worldview. You know, Jesus Christ in the Bible is very important. It's not just something people have a tendency to segregate life and think, well, this is religion, this is mathematics, this is science. No, no, no. Jesus Christ is Lord of science, he's Lord of mathematics, he's Lord of history, and you want to teach the Christian worldview and the importance of Jesus Christ in every area that you teach your son or daughter. Jesus Christ in science, Jesus Christ in history, and a Christian worldview in all these areas. It's very, very important. There is no neutrality. I want you to remember that, folks. There is no neutrality. You have to either serve the Lord Jesus Christ and honor him in all areas of life, or you are serving an alien worldview, and you are serving uh, basically the state and bowing to the state when you give your kids over to the public schools and when you also give them over to the television set and to the Ninja Turtles and all that. Now, what we want you to do, folks, is send for this book. It's called Biblical Principles for Solving Problems in the Home. This is a very good book where we tell you how to deal with arguments, how to deal with anger in the home. Why is it important to have a uh, Christian homeschooling in all these areas. We, you know, we deal with these subjects in this book, and we'd really like you to get a copy of that. Uh, it's very, very important that you do so. You know, one of the main things that's really been a critical issue these days is the area of spanking. Now, we're taught by the state and by secular people that spanking is wicked and terrible. Now, does does the Bible allow for spanking, Stephen? Well, Brian, not only does the Bible allow for spanking, but actually the Bible. Uh, tells Christian parents that they must uh, spank their children. Now, we're not talking about child abuse here. Or we're not talking about beating a child mercilessly or beating him within a, an inch of his life. Uh, we're talking about uh, godly correction. And let me read to you uh, from the wisdom literature of the Bible, from the book of Proverbs. And in Proverbs 13, it says this, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes or chasteneth him when it is necessary. And so here we see that uh, uh, spanking a child is actually an expression of love. It's an expression of the love that the parent has for the child. And again, we're not talking about child abuse. Uh, we're not talking about uh, uh, spanking a child or beating up on a child uh, uh, when he has exercised childish irresponsibility. We're not talking about uh, giving a child a black eye when he knocks over his milk and spills it all over the table and onto the floor. We're not talking about childish irresponsibility here, but we're talking about willful disobedience. And the Bible teaches that when a child willfully disobeys, when there's a clear uh, command, when there are clear limits that are given to the child, and when the child steps over those limits deliberately, wanting to see if the parent loves him enough to do something about it, then at that time, that is a time when a spanking is appropriate. Again, the book of Proverbs says that's an expression of love. And if you really hate your child, let him do anything he wants, and he's going to choose the wrong way. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's the way your child is going to choose. And so, yes, the Bible does allow for spanking. And I know, Brian, it's been in the papers a lot lately. There was an incident recently in one of the schools where uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, a teacher was accused of spanking, and it's against the law to spank a child in the, in the public schools in the state of Michigan. And, and so there's a great uh, investigation and all of that. But uh, when